and welcome. My name is Bridget Byrne. I'm the Director of Code, the Centre on the Dynamics of Ethnicity at the University of Manchester. And I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening to this event. Uh, tonight, we're talking about a new report published today entitled Racial Bias and the Bench, a response to the Judicial Diversity and Inclusion Strategy with a distinguished panel of speakers. This is a groundbreaking report on an under-examined area of the justice system, which further, furthers understandings of institutionalized racism within the system, carefully examining the judicial diversity and inclusion strategy, and also providing original research on the experiences of legal professionals. This event is sponsored by the University of Manchester, Garden Court Chambers and Court Code. So just briefly to let you know how it's going to work. We've a series of short presentations from our speakers, uh, Keir Monteith QC from Garden Court Chambers and a University of Manchester Simon Fellow, Leslie Thomas QC from Garden Court Chambers and Gresham College, Professor Ethna Quinn and Dr. Remy Rose Joseph Sal Salisbury from the University of Manchester, Professor Andrea Dennis is the, the John Bird Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia, and Stephanie Needleman, Legal Director of Justice. So we're going to have those uh, short presentations. We'll then take questions from the audience to the panel. If you could please put your questions in the Q&A box on screen and I'll put them to the panel. And please feel free to add to these questions at any point in the presentations and I'll field them at the end. The webinar is being recorded and will be made publicly available shortly after the session. Only the speakers will be visible on the recording. If you want to submit a question but not be mentioned by name, please include that in the question. So I'm very pleased first to present, uh, to introduce Keir Monteith uh, KC, uh, who's a barrister at Garden Court Chambers and a highly sought after leading silk who represents clients facing heavyweight criminal allegations. He also sits as a recorder. Keir became a Simon Fellow at the University of Manchester in September 2021, and he's used that fellowship to co-author this report. He's also initiated a series of high-profile webinars that examined the state's criminalisation of black youth throughout, through racist stereotypes of gangs and drill music, as well as spearheading a series of Black Lives Matter webinars. So I'm going to hand over to Keith and if the other presenters want to turn off their videos. Thank you very much indeed. Bridget, I'll start at the beginning, uh, both globally and nationally. 2020 was a year of unprecedented anti-racist mobilizations as huge numbers took to the streets to insist Black Lives Matter. Protesters demanded a reckoning with racism that underpins policing and the justice system specifically and society and its institutions more broadly. Against this backdrop, in November 2020, the Lord Chief Justice launched the Judicial Diversity and Inclusion Strategy to increase the ethnic and professional diversity of the judiciary. Whilst the strategy has initiated some potentially positive work with leadership judges, outreach, activities and suggestions for judicial training, it suffers from a fundamental flaw. It does not even consider the issue of racism. Indeed, the words racial bias and racism are not mentioned. And the word race appears only once in a footnote. Our report Racial Bias in the Bench was created in response to the launch of the strategy and it assesses its proposals and early progress in regard to race and ethnicity. We review racial bias as well as anti-racism among judicial office holders. This report builds on the excellent work by others who seek to racially reform and remake our justice system. Racial bias and the bench is the culmination of a year of our team speaking to experts in race awareness training, lawyers, judges, equality and diversity leads, and our own analysis and research. We also commissioned a survey which yielded unique data and importantly, underlined 
in capitals. Importantly, during this survey, 119 legal professionals took time out to write down what they had witnessed and experienced in and out of the courtroom. First hand accounts of racial bias, racism, and on occasion, anti racism. For a flavour of the survey comments, when you get the report, please read, read through section one. We have eight themed subsections. I'm just going to ask for the first slide to be put on uh, to help us go through three quotes that we've selected. The first, I would have to write for pages and pages to express the racism I have seen. Two, the tendency to always believe the police I heard. Why would the police lie more times than I can count? And three, I practice in extradition and immigration. The problems often feel systemic. What our report finds, combining its quantitative and qualitative data, supported by work of others, amounts to evidence of institutional racism in the justice system, presided over by judges. This conclusion has worrying consequences for the rule of law. It's no wonder the public's trust in the system that is supposed to protect us is in decline. Here we are in Black History Month, and it's worth taking a minute to reflect on the contrast between the importance of talking about Black history, the struggles, the ongoing struggles, the institutional racism in our public bodies, and the silence on the topic of racism in the five year strategy. A strategy which is designed, it says, to deal with the lack of diversity within the judiciary. Racism in an institution has to be talked about openly and honestly, not erased, not ignored, not rewritten, as if there is no problem. I've been in the system for almost three decades, now a KC and a part-time judge. And it's with great sadness that I read the results of our survey, that I read the evidence from the lawyers and part-time judges, and I review the government's own figures on diversity in the judiciary. It's upsetting, it's got to change, and we make 10 recommendations for action. First and foremost, what we ask for is no more than what leaders of many other institutions have done and what a group of US judges have said. A good example in the UK is the Bar Council. In their Race at the Bar report, they talked about intersectionality in the justice system. And we'll go to the next slide, please. And then said in the middle, this intersectionality is especially acute in the legal profession, where we are conscious that barristers work as part of a legal system affected by structural racism, particularly in the criminal justice system. For those who work at the bar, their career is not purely based on an objective meritocratic evaluation of their own ability. Access to the bar, career progression, access to the most prestigious and best paying work, retention and working environment are all bound up with forms of privilege and power. And as far as we're concerned, this statement applies to all who work in the justice system. Our first recommendation states, and we'll just get it on the screen, 
acknowledge institutional racism in the justice system. The Lord Chief Justice and leadership judges should, like the Bar Council has, publicly acknowledge and recognize that the justice system is institutionally racist. Only by admitting the problem can steps for real progress be made, such as redrawing the founding objectives of the judicial diversity and inclusion strategy. Our report is 40 pages long, but it can be summed up in two sentences. Meaningful sol solutions have been proposed by us and many others. What has remained lacking is the political will to publicly acknowledge that institutional racism in the justice system exists and to make changes that not only address this toxic problem, but have knock-on benefits in building a fairer, more resilient, and more democratically accountable judiciary. Please, when this launch is over, read the report. Pass it on, talk about racism in the justice system and the actions you are going to take. Judges, lawyers, and those at the top need to be proactive. As Angela Davis said, in a racist society, it's not enough to be non-racist. We must be anti-racist. In November 2020, the Bar Standards Board, and I quote, published an anti-racist statement which aims to reduce race inequality at the Bar of England and Wales and asked all chambers to do the same, end quote. So it, it is not surprising that that's what we ask the Lord Chief Justice to do. I've got about four minutes left to take you through the most important parts of our report, Racial Bias and the Bench. There are three sections. Maybe just take down uh, that slide as I go through them. Section, so just take away that slide and I'll come back to that in a moment. Section one is the report's bedrock, where you will find details and analysis of our survey findings. You'll find upsetting and troubling evidence of racism in the justice system, racial bias in the courtroom. It's there, it cannot be ignored, it cannot be explained away. Section two focuses on race training and education for judges, it reviews the strategies proposals in this area, what can be learned from previous training initiatives and a review of the equal treatment bench book with proposals for fundamental change. Section three focuses on questions of racial equality and representation in the judicial workplace. It reviews the strategies claims about a level playing field for recruitment, and contrasts those with government statistics, justice reports, and evidence from our survey respondents. All sections lead in the same direction. The judiciary has to be honest about the problem of racism in the justice system. The judiciary has to be aware that empty diversity and inclusion exercises that sound like the real deal, risk serving as a distraction from the urgent need for significant anti-racist change in the justice system. In the last few minutes of my time, I'm going to highlight our key findings. I'll take you through the recommendations once you've heard from all the speakers. So we have the next slide, please. Thank you. This is on page six of the reports. We'll just go through them. Racial bias plays a significant role in the justice system. 95% of legal professionals, that's lawyers and part-time judges that survey, we surveyed, said that the racial bias plays some role in the processes or the outcomes of the justice system. 63% said it played a significant role and just under a third, 29%, said it played a fundamental role. 
This finding is of constitutional significance and it requires immediate and urgent action. This is legal professionals in 2022 telling us about their perceptions of the role of racial bias in the justice system. This finding doesn't stand alone and it's linked to the following findings. Numerous survey comments offering examples of discriminatory practices by judges with many regarding judicial racial bias as commonplace. Over half, 56%, stated they'd witnessed one or more judges acting in a racially biased way towards a defendant. Racial discrimination by judges was most frequently directed towards Asian and Black people, with people from the Black communities being the most common targets of judicial discrimination. The most frequently mentioned subgroup was young Black male defendants. Some survey respondents had seen judges act in anti-racist ways. For example, 26% said they'd seen one or more judges act with anti-racism towards a defendant. There is good news, and it was captured by a number of the people were surveyed, who provided examples of good practice where judges, and I quote, addressed head-on issues of structural racism allowing a young defendant to feel seen and heard, end quote. And where, quote, the judge further acknowledged how difficult it was for me as a black barrister to make such a submission, end quote. The approach of that judge is a breath of fresh air. With that honesty, we have justice. But sadly, the vast majority of our survey responses provided evidence of racial bias. Race training is neither compulsory nor provided on a regular basis to the judiciary or indeed to other legal professionals. Only 49% of the survey respondents who've worked as judges had received any race training in the preceding three years. We'll go over to the next page, please. Next page. Um, the appointment of judges seems to depend very much on ethnicity. The government's 22 statistics demonstrate the conversion rate from application to judicial appointment for Asian and black candidates was 37%. Sorry, we need to go back. This is, we're still on findings. Um, to judicial appointment for Asian and black candidates was 37% and 75% lower respectively than for white candidates. When intersectionality is taken into account, the discrepancy is even more stark. Ethnic minority female solicitors are the least likely to be appointed as a judge. Despite the figures above, the strategy states that judicial appointments are currently made on merit, following a fair and open competition from the widest eligible uh, range of candidates. This is in denial about exclusionary structures and attitudes that shape decision making and largely ignores over 50 years of proposals by justice for structural change. The Equal Treatment Bench Book given to all judges on appointment as a key reference point, contains just one chapter, chapter eight, devoted to race, which includes little acknowledgement of anti-black racism. This is despite the serious disproportionalities in representation and treatment of black people in the justice system. This important book is considered in some detail in section two. Since 2020, this is the last uh, finding. There's been only one published judicial con conduct investigation office decision in which racism was found against a judge. The lack of correlation between the single upheld complaint and our survey results and previous reports of racism indicates that the complaint system isn't working properly. The authors of this report want to have a dialogue with the Lord Chief Justice and the people that can influence change. 
so that in the next survey, the majority of the respondents report back that there has been a culture shift, a structural change that has to happen as we can't carry on with 95% of legal professionals saying that racial bias plays some role in the processes or the outcomes of the justice system. I'm now gonna hand you safely back to our chair so you can hear more from our excellent and distinguished panel. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Keir. Uh, welcome those who joined since uh, I first welcomed you. Um, please add any questions as you as we go along in the Q and A uh, button at the bottom, and we'll come to them at the end of the talk. I'm very pleased now to welcome Professor Leslie Thomas Casey, who's a civil human rights and civil liberties barrister. He's appeared in many high profile cases, um, including representing the families of the deceased of the Birmingham pub bombing inquest, the Grenfell inquiry, and many others. In uh, 2012, he was awarded the Legal Aid Barrister of the Year, and again in 2016 for his work, work on the Hillsborough disaster. And in 2020, he received the award for outstanding contribution to diversity and inclusion in the UK Chambers Bar Award. Um, he's in 2020 he became the first black professor of law at Gresham College. He's a visiting professor of law at Goldsmiths and sits on the Equality, Diversity, Inclusion Subcommittee of the Inner Temple and Bar Standards Board uh, Race Equality Task Force and is the author of Do Right and Fear No One, his autobiography published in 2022. So I'm going to hand over to you now, Leslie. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, I want to say congratulations to the authors of this report. It's a long time coming, and um, I just hope that it begins the process whereby we begin to look at the issue of race in the judiciary. You see, judges are some of the most powerful actors in our society, and the decisions they make can often be life-changing for individuals, communities, and society as a whole. At some point in your life, you may come in front of a judge who may decide whether you go to prison or whether you lose your home, lose your state benefits, or in fact, the custody of your children. A good judge can transform lives for better. A bad judge can ruin lives irreparably. A racist judge, well, that just doesn't even you can't even imagine what it'd be like if you're on the receiving end. You see, the judiciary is an institution, and all institutions have ingrained patterns and behaviours, often, but not always, unconscious. As an institution, the judiciary can be racist. There are several cases which I touch upon in a recent Gresham lecture on judges and whether judges can be racist. I don't go through those cases tonight, but it's there for you to have a look at. You see, what we need to bear in mind is this. When we look at our judiciary, we have to not just focus on um, uh, who they are, but the decisions they come to and what they say and whether or not we can have confidence in our judiciary. In my recent Gresham lecture, I posed the following questions when looking at three Supreme Court cases. I asked this question, I say, would, the, would all of these cases have gone the same way if we had a genuinely diverse senior judiciary? You know, would they have gone the same way if when looking at the case of Roberts, we had Supreme Court justices who had had the lived experience of racialized stop and search, or in some of the immigration cases, justices had lived experience of the immigration system. In the cases that I refer to, we will never know. But I truly believe that our judicial system does have a race problem, often unacknowledged, and or reluctant to confront. 
And I hope that this report opens the door for discussion and sets out a roadmap for change. The real question will be is, is that path one that our judiciary will be willing to walk down? Only time will tell. I want to finish with this. Jameson against McLennan. This was a, an American case. And these are the first 20 lines of that decision. Clarence Jameson wasn't jaywalking. That was Michael Brown. He wasn't playing outside with a toy gun. That was 12 year old Tamar Rice. He didn't look like a suspicious person. That was Elijah McLean. He wasn't suspected of selling loose cigarettes. That was Eric Gardner. He wasn't suspected of passing a counterfeit $20 bill. That was George Floyd. He didn't look like anyone suspected of a crime. That was Philando Castile and Tony McDade. He wasn't mentally ill and in need of help. That was Jason Harrison. He wasn't assisting an autistic patient who had wandered away from a group home. That was Charles Kinsey. He wasn't walking home from an after-school job. That was 17-year-old James L. Green. He wasn't walking back from a restaurant. He wasn't hanging out on a college campus. That was Ben Brown. He, he wasn't standing outside his apartment. That was Amado Diallo. He wasn't inside his apartment eating ice cream. That was both and John. He wasn't sleeping in his bed. That was Brianna Taylor. He wasn't sleeping in his car. That was Rayshard Brooks. He didn't make an improper lane change. That was Sandra Bland. He didn't have a broken tail light. That was Walter Scott. He wasn't driving under the speed limit. That was Ace Perry. No, Clarence Jameson was a black man driving a Mercedes convertible. And as he made his way home to South Carolina on vac um, from vacation in Arizona, he was pulled over and subjected to 110 minutes of an armed police officer badgering him, pressuring him, lying to him, and then searching his car top to bottom for drugs. Nothing was found. Jameson isn't a drugs courier, he's a welder. Unsatisfied, the officer then brought a canine to sniff the car. The dog found nothing. So nearly two hours after it started, the officer left Jameson by the side of the road to put his car back together. Thankfully, Jameson left the stop with his life. Too many others have not. Oh, not that it should matter, but Judge Reeves, who gave that decision, is a black judge. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leslie. We're now going to hear from uh, Ethna Quinn, who's a professor in the Faculty of Humanities at the University of Manchester. She's the author of award, an award-winning book on race and work in the cultural industries, and recently led an Arts and Humanities Research Council project on the legal use of black youth culture in the criminal justice system of, of England and Wales. And she's a, the academic lead of this report. Hi, thanks, Bridget. Um, <clears throat> I was just about to share my screen and it says that it's disabled. Could somebody enable me to share my screen? Is that possible? I've got slides. You should be able to do it now, Ethna. Thank you. So I want to talk about um, uh, uh, training and education. So I'm just struggling to maximize my screen. Uh, just try. OK. 
I'm struggling. Can, can, you can all see my, my slides. Um, the, the, the row is behind it, so I can't um, uh, share it now. But you can all see my slides, can you? Yeah, OK. So yeah, I want to talk about training and education, which is the is section two of the report. And this is the, um, these are the, the subsections within that section. In light of the racial bias and racism that we've been hearing about and that we've, uh, and others have found in the system, we ask what role do training and guidance play in confronting um, injustice? Racist processes are complex and ubiquitous, um, something we'll be hearing more from uh, Remy about, I think, and legal practitioners, including judges, clearly need support in better understanding overt and especially covert racism. <clears throat> so a first question we asked our legal professional survey respondents was, have they done any race training recently? <clears throat> We found that um, training isn't consistently undertaken by legal professionals, as Kia's already mentioned in the key findings. Uh, just over half of our respondents, 54%, hadn't received any training in the preceding three years. And our sense is that many of those who said they'd done some race training did it as part of a more generic equality, diversity and inclusion package, perhaps an unconscious bias workshop or something. Importantly, the numbers were similar for judges. Uh, we had 45 part-time judges who answered the survey, um, enough to give a loose indication of rates of training, um, at least among that group of judges. And we found that only half had undergone some training in the preceding three years. So similar statistics than the legal professionals in general in our survey sample. Importantly, the numbers were similar that for, for them. Um, and, and when we consider the problem of festering racism and the disproportionalities in many parts of the legal system, the lack of engagement by many with race training is worrying. Racism that exists can remain unchallenged, discounted, and for many unseen. Um, it's an environment in which it's easy for some judges to be dismissive about racism. And numerous of our survey respondents uh, described judicial di disavowals of racism that they'd witnessed. What we saw lots of evidence, quite a lot of evidence of in our survey findings were descriptions of the shutting down of race and the discussion of racism in the courtroom by judges. Um, sometimes the denial of, uh, of bias identified in our respondents was done subtly. Um, uh, I've got a few examples of different kinds of ones we, that we um, feature in the report. Expressing exasperation, this is a judge, um, when race issues raised by the defense counsel um, as though they're, they're irrelevant. In essence, the legal system is rife with an undercurrent of racism, but not overtly. What is worse than being a racist, being called a racist. And that's actually part of an interesting comment about um, the really the objections of the really strong objections to mentions of racism rather than objections to the fact of the racism that's being um, complained about. Uh, and finally, their judges are routinely ignorant and dismissive of issues pertaining to race, often asserting that we don't see colour. So this last one um, is, is, is more of a subtle one. Um, uh, it's, it's said in the name uh, of colour blindness, of, of liberal tolerance. We, we're above, we don't see race, we're above race. And this we found was a theme that was um, partly continued in the judges' equalities textbook, the Equal Treatment Bench Book, a manual we looked at quite extensively in our report, as Kia mentioned. So yeah, the, the bench book then briefly. Um, for those who don't know, it's, it's a manual that's given to all judges um, on appointment as a key reference point. It contains one long chapter on uh, race, uh, devoted to race chapter eight. Um, there are lots of good things in this manual, including in relation to race, which some of our survey respondents co commended. Uh, so just to indicate the positive work the bench book is already doing, uh, and this is one of three um, positive mentions. Um, I have made submissions quoting the, the bench book passages on the disparity of treatment of black and Asian defendants in, in comparison to their white counterparts. Whilst judges may feel uncomfortable being challenged this way, particularly at sentencing hearings, I have found the bench book an invaluable source when gently but firmly reminding judges not to treat defendants more harshly because they are black and brown. Um, so that's so there were three comments like that. There were positive uses of the bench books. It's doing it's doing uh, good work in, in this regard. However, we also found some inadvertent serious omissions and flawed assumptions in the bench book that we believe need to be addressed. Two main things that we explore in our report. 
first in chapter eight, um, we found that for all the bench books uh, length and for all this chapter's length, you'll, you'll see a lot of subsections. There's, there's, things, um, there's, there's one there on the right-hand side um, on anti-Semitism. There's one there on Islamophobia, um, quite rightly. Um, these ones have their own subsections. There isn't a commensurate subsection on anti-Black racism. There is a subsection called Black Perspectives on the left-hand side there, you'll see it uh, two thirds of the way down. But in this bit, the focus, as the title suggests, is more about black perceptions of racial fairness and injustice in the legal system. It doesn't foreground actual racism that targets black people in a commensurate way um, to other groups. And that's concerning. Um, it has to be understood in relation to the wealth of testimony, as we were hearing about tonight, of legal professionals describing anti-black bias in the courts and by judges, much more than any other category of racism. In light of all the evidence of racism towards black people, the bench book coverage of racism towards black people is very inadequate um, and captures a wider problem, we believe, of complacency towards this pernicious type of racism. Uh, we go into that in, in, in more detail in the report and call for action. And just quickly then, the second um, of um, the issues with the bench book then is its overall framing. At the very start of the introduction, it makes the, the following um, statement, uh, very, very start of the, of the, of the book, 500-word book. Uh, for most, the principles of fair treatment and equality will be inherent in everything they do as judges, and they will understand these concepts very well. So it sounds good, and we expect the author, authors think it's a good way to disarm judges and to get them reading this, this long book, but it concedes too much. It's misleading. It suggests to judges that they have little to learn about bias and stigma at the very start. Because, of course, we all harbor biases, it's simply a truism, a starting assumption of implicit bias training courses used in institutions across the country. Judges are, of course, not exempt from such socially and psychologically informed stereotypical thinking. And the biases of judges um, as key decision makers are very consequential. There's some research coming out of the US that we cite, which shows that unconscious biases among judges might be even more problematic than overtly understood ones. In a study by a sitting district court judge in the US of sentencing decisions, he found that those judges who were only unconsciously biased who saw themselves as racially benign in the courtroom were found to be more susceptible of acting in biased ways because they weren't aware of their own bias and weren't deliberately trying to constrain it. So we're looking for some changes to the bench book and at the same time we see the bench book is symptomatic of a wider concern of disavowal of, of bias and racism and particularly of the curious neglect of, of anti-black racism as I was saying. Um, but it, it's, never, it's a very long book, it's inevitably very uneven, and of course it's very strong. It, it has pockets that are very strong on racism too, but it, it definitely needs, I think, some, um, some uh, revision. Updating the bench book should, start, should be part, actually, of developing high-quality training for each and every judge. We call for this knowing that there are lots of problems with lots of types of race training. Indeed, bad training can even be counterproductive, as we discuss in the report. As Kia was saying, training has to be part of a multi-pronged approach supported by and in support of wider, an, a wider anti-racist project. Much of the report makes um, depressing reading, but there were inspiring and instructive findings in our survey results too. As well as racial bias, we asked about practices of anti-racism, as Kia mentioned. The respondents offered some really rich accounts of deep racial literacy by some professionals, often operating in difficult circumstances. So I wanted to just end with a few examples uh, from these um, comments. The first one, and resu uh, result made clear judge was displeased with tone of prosecution counsel's submission, which may have indicated bias. Another one, this judge listened and engaged with my submissions, then passed a sentence. Um, and that's one that I think Kira already mentioned. And finally, I can only recall one judge, a recorder who I appeared in front of on a couple of occasions who acted in an anti-racist way. And he did so by explicitly acknowledging and referring to the race of the defendants during the process. This recorder, who was himself mixed race heritage, never progressed to be a circuit judge and no longer sits as a judge. So the final one um, is a little more somber. 
Um, but these are instances, these, these instances are precious and rare, but actually we saw a lot of activity and there's a lot of evidence amongst the survey findings of this kind of uh, anti-racist praxis uh, that's taking place and that really needs to be recognized and promoted um, uh, along with high quality bespoke training um, and, and all of that together, we hope will accelerate change. Thank you. Many thanks, Esna. Um, we're now going to hear from uh, Dr. Remy Joseph Salisbury, who's a presidential fellow at the University of Manchester, a senior lecturer in sociology and a member of the Centre of the on the Dynamics of Ethnicity. Remy's work research focuses on racism and anti-racism, uh, primarily in the context of education and policing. So thanks, Remy. Thanks, Bridget. Good evening, everybody. So there are two points from the report that I want to highlight, um, specifically institutional racism and anti-Black racism. So one of the recommendations of the report, as we've heard from Keir, is to acknowledge inst institutional racism in the justice system. The conviction behind this is that this has to be the starting point, but it cannot be the end point. We have to properly understand and recognize and admit to the problem and be prepared to face it head on in order to address it. The late critical race theorist Derek Bell said of racism that we can only delegitimate it if we accurately pinpoint it. Recognizing it in its institutional form takes us some way towards doing this. The late director of the Institute of Race Relations, Asa Benandan, said, and I quote, Institutional racism is that which covertly or overtly resides in the policies, procedures, operations, and culture of public or private institutions, reinforcing individual prejudices and being reinforced by them in turn. So what we're talking about is not just individual racism, although that is part of the picture, but a problem that's deeply embedded in the justice system. This recognition shapes the interventions that can address the problem. So the training, for example, that is recommended is predicated on a recognition that racism is institutional as well as interpersonal. Recognizing racism as institutional shows us that piecemeal and isolated interventions cannot be enough given the gravity of what we're talking about. So what's needed is a multi-pronged approach. The recommendations of the report, therefore, are interrelated and inadequate in isolation or without support of the other interventions. And the second point I want to touch on briefly that Ethna has alluded to a little already is anti-Black racism. We wanted to place a spotlight specifically on anti-Black racism. Whilst, as we've heard, the 2021 bench book has very little to say on anti-Black racism, the responses to this survey suggest that this is something we really need to be paying much closer attention to. And that's further underlined by the staggering disproportionalities in the representation of and treatment of Black people in the justice system. Whether as lawyers, witnesses or defendants, people from Black communities were cited by survey respondents to be by far the most common targets of judicial discrimination. I just want to read two quotes from the report. First, racial bias is far more commonplace. Judges disbelieve black men who are sole carers for their children. The mistake counsel in robes for the client, allowing irrelevant gangs matrix and rap drill evidence. And the second, every single case I have had with a black parent, they have been described as aggressive every case I have kept to tell. So it's clear that respondents are striving to highlight the particular ways in which anti-black racism operates in the justice system. And this is compounded by the government's 2022 statistics, which demonstrate that the conversion rate from application to judicial appointment for black candidates was 75% lower respectively than for su successful white candidates. There can be in no doubt that anti-Black racism needs to be taken seriously as part of this report and the action that follows. Thank you. Many thanks, Remy. 
Um, we're now going to hear from Professor Andrea Dennis, the John Bird Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia. Her scholarship explores criminal defence. I realised I'm muted, sorry. <laughs> We're going to uh, now turn to Professor Andrea Dennis, the John Bird Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia. Uh, Andrea's scholarship explores criminal defence lawyering, race and criminal justice, criminal informants and cooperators, youth advocacy, legal socialisation of youth and the cradle, cradle to prison pipeline. Her book, Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics and Guilt in America, has received national attention and courts nationwide in the US have cited her research on rap lyrics as criminal evidence. Uh, many thanks, Andrea. Thank you so much uh, and good uh, afternoon. Uh, it's afternoon for me here uh, in the States. I was um, uh, very happy to be invited to join this effort and I'm glad to be here um, to talk a little bit about what is happening in the United States. Um, and so I think, unfortunately, I would just say the news is not good, right? It um, To begin, I should say, it. Uh, should go without being said that uh, racism is deeply embedded within the criminal legal system and the uh, legal system more broadly here in the United States. And I think the poignant examples um, discussed by Leslie are just uh, examples and they are merely the most recent tip of the iceberg. Um, but with respect to um, efforts to increase the diversity of the judiciary and deal with uh, racism that is embedded within the legal system, uh, the United States overall, I would say, is not a, a good leader. It is not a, necessarily a thought leader in this respect. Um, and we don't necessarily offer a good model for how to move forward. Um, we have had some recent attention, as you all have, in efforts to move forward, but um, we have not made great strides uh, either. So just generally, I would say, without question, the federal and state court systems here in the United States are not representative of the actual population. The federal and state high courts overwhelmingly are male and white. And with respect to lower federal courts and lower state courts. It's um, quite hard to determine the diversity of those particular uh, benches um, because there is a lack of comprehensive publicly available data um, in contrast to the highest federal courts and highest state courts. Of course, this is problematic because the vast majority of the cases are reserved, resolved excuse me, in lower federal courts and in lower state courts. So with respect to diversity, the, the numbers are not um, uh, surprising, but they are also not uh, uh, helpful or um, uh, happy news. I think um, like uh, you all, we've identified a number of barriers that have led to difficulty diversifying American courts, right? So this would include the um, long-standing um, racial discrimination in the United States, and that would include, of course, unequal access to law schools and joining the bar. Additional barriers include um, sec secretive and opaque nominations processes, uh, difficulty raising funds for elections, um, the special interest groups that support and are involved in elections um, have also become uh, challenges that uh, need to be dealt with. There have been some efforts to diversify the bench from practitioners and advocates and policymakers uh, nationwide. Uh, and so um, I would say, though, that there is not any particular uniform or singular approach. So uh, practicing lawyers have been at the forefront of these particular efforts. So the American Bar Association, which is a national professional organization, a voluntary professional organization here in the States, uh, that also accredits law schools um, and provides resources and standards, um, did in 2012 adopt a diversity action plan, which is still in effect and it is reviewed annually. It's uh, debatable how much impact that um, uh, plan actually has. Um, additionally, the American Bar Association, the ABA, has a judicial division standing committee on diversity in the judiciary and its particular mission is to promote the full participation of minority judges in the judicial system and attract minority judges into the American Bar Association. So at least 
um, practitioners here in the United States, including both lawyers and judges, uh, have been uh, attentive to the issue at least since the early 2000s. More recently, uh, in 2020, the Conference of Chief Justices and State Court Administrators, so these are the Chief Justices of the highest state courts and the clerks who administer those courts, um, have uh, uh, come together to issue a proclamation or a public acknowledgement uh, in support of racial equality and justice in the legal system. And it is closely aligned with the National Center for State Courts, which is a nonprofit organization here in the United States that is aimed at improving judicial administration in state courts. Uh, and together, those two entities are working to improve diversity in, uh, in particular in state courts. Um, the National Center for State Courts has hired a uh, racial justice, equity, and inclusion director, and that is the first uh, person who has held such a position. And together with the Conference of Chief Justices and Conference of State Court Administrators, the National Conference for State Courts has uh, implemented uh, a blueprint for racial justice, which is designed to deal with uh, systemic concerns and ensure that all court users and litigants and community members are heard and respected. Um, and so they have begun work within the last uh, uh, couple of years. Um, and so those are the efforts by uh, actual um, uh, professional organizations for judges. The last point I would just make is that um, in addition, the American Bar Association, as I mentioned, accredits uh, the uh, law schools here in the United States. And uh, it has, as uh, effective earlier this year, mandated that law schools provide multiple opportunities for students to learn about bias, cross-cultural competency, and racism while in law school. And so this is a new requirement for accreditation of law schools and will be uh, measured uh, and evaluated um, each time that a law school undergoes uh, review. Um, and uh, relatedly, various um, states do require continuing legal education and continuing judicial education. And uh, in some, uh, some jurisdictions that does include particular focus on uh, bias and cross-cultural competency and racism, but that is not uniform uh, throughout the nation. And so it remains to be seen um, to what extent uh, increased educational opportunities in law school and in continuing legal and judicial education will actually improve um, diversity within the judiciary and decrease racism within the actual administration of legal justice. So um, I, uh, again, am delighted to be here and offer those thoughts uh, and uh, look forward to continued work with uh, you all um, over you know, in the UK and thinking about what we can do to improve diversity and anti-racism in both sets of uh, legal systems. Thank you. Many thanks, Andrea. Uh, it's great to hear from the US perspective. Um, our, our final speaker before we go back to the recommendations from Keir is Stephanie Needleman, the legal director and lawyer at Justice, uh, a law reform and human rights organization that works to make the justice system fairer and more accessible for all. Uh, Stephanie is responsible for Justice's legal and policy output, which cuts across all areas of just, the justice system. Um, prior to the taking up this role, she was the public and, uh, and administrative administrative lawyer at Justice and is a trained and qualified solicitor. Uh, thanks very much, Stephanie. Thanks, Bridget. Um, firstly, I just wanted to echo Leslie's congratulations to the authors um, of this incredibly important report. Um, for those of you who don't know Justice, the reason that I've been asked to speak on this evening's panel is that Justice has published a number of reports examining the judiciary, judicial appointments and judicial diversity. The first of which was published in 1972 and most recently in 2020. So Keir has set me the task of presenting 50 years of justice reports in five minutes. Whilst that might sound like a tall order, it is perhaps unfortunately easier than it might appear. This is because whilst we've seen significant changes in the judicial appointments process over the course of those 50 years, most significantly moving from a tap on the shoulder by the Lord Chancellor, to the formalization of the appointments process under the auspices of the Judicial Appointments Commission. 
Unfortunately, when it comes to racial diversity of our senior judiciary in particular, progress has been far too slow and interventions to date insufficient. I wanted to read a quote from Justice's 1992 report on the judiciary. The judiciary is dominated by white males. The historical reason for this, namely that white males overwhelmingly dominate the profession at all levels at which judicial appointments are made, is ceasing to be valid. Women and members of ethnic minorities have entered the profession in substantial numbers, and many have now reached the point of eligibility for appointment. Yet it would appear that of the cohort eligible for appointment to assistant recorder and recorder, a smaller proportion are appointed than the proportion of eligible white males. This means in due course that there will be fewer such persons to appoint to senior positions. The apparent case of bias needs to be tackled now. Unfortunately, this quote rings as true now as it did 30 years ago. To pick out a few of the most recent statistics on racial diversity of our judiciary, we still have not had a black or ethnic minority Supreme Court justice. And unless one of the current justices retires early, there will not be an opportunity to appoint one for another two years. The Court of Appeal has no black judges, just 1% of the judiciary are black, a figure that has not changed since 2014. Whilst Asian, Black and other ethnic minority candidates have been overrepresented in applications for judicial appointment for the past three years, as we have heard from a number of other speakers this evening, all have had lower recommendation rates than white candidates. And this difference in success for applying for judicial office remains even when you control for other factors that may influence selection. The Ministry of Justice did a statistical exercise where they controlled for two other factors, one was legal profession. We know that solicitors are less likely to be successful in their applications than barristers, and the other Oxbridge attendants. And even controlling for these two factors, the differential success rates between white and minority ethnic candidates still remained. As we've also heard, intersectionality plays a huge role. Ethnic minority female solicitors are the least likely group of candidates to be successful in their applications for judicial office. So, what do we need to do about it? Firstly, statutory consultation, the process whereby existing judges' opinions are sought and the suitability of the applicant for the job should be removed entirely. Second, the concept of merit should be better defined so that it is not a vehicle for unconscious bias and a tendency to replicate the characteristics in the existing judici judiciary. The ability to contribute to a diverse judiciary should also be taken into account in assessing merit. We need a proper examination of the appointments process to uncover why it is that the recommendation rates are so much lower for black and minority ethnic applicants. An internal career path for judges from the tribunals and lower ranks of the judiciary, something that justice has been recommending since 1972, would also assist. The tribunals and lower ranks of the judiciary are considerably more diverse than the senior echelons. However, yet our, our 2020 report found that there was still minimal progression of judges from the tribunals to other judicial roles. The few cases in which such progression occurs, this is normally from the upper tribunal, but there's, there is also minimal progression between the first tier tribunal and upper tribunal. The JAC merit criteria appear to require candidates to demonstrate judge craft skills, yet those judges who are salaried in tribunals and are therefore developing these skills through full time sitting are far less likely to progress to higher judicial office. It is important that we understand why experience gained in this capacity does not translate into greater success in senior exercises. As the report notes, there has been some potential progress in this area. The Lord Chief Justice recently announced plans for a one judiciary in which courts and tribunals will be unified into a single judicial family. Partly it is stated to promote a working environment in which all judges have opportunities to progress, irrespective of personal or professional background. Justice welcome this this, welcomes this development and we hope that these opportunities to progress materialize. However, in order to do so, unification will need to be accompanied by a material shift in how tribunal judges skills and experience are viewed. 
And another recommendation that um, justice has previously made to improve um, diversity is targets with teeth. I want to stress that these are not the same as quotas. Quotas require the appointment of candidates with particular characteristics. The targets we propose would be a public, publicly expressed intention to recruit a particular number or proportion of judges with certain characteristics and who meet the required standard. These targets would have teeth in that they, they will come with an obligation to report and to explain continued efforts to be made to meet the target should it not be reached. Without such targets, I believe that insufficient priority will continue to be placed on diverse appointments. And the reasons for the lack of diverse appointments will remain insufficiently interrogated and understood. Finally, as, the, as the, this report concludes, it is critical that those in leadership positions prioritize and commit to the cultural change necessary to transform the demographics of our judiciary in a meaningful and sustainable way. When Justice wrote its report in 2020, we felt that judicial diversity was still seen as tangential to quality in judging rather than fundamental to it. I think that this report demonstrates that this is clearly not the case. Whilst, as the report authors acknowledge, greater diversity is not a panacea for tackling racial bias, it is a crucial step towards it. And without fundamental improvements in diversity, the quality and legitimacy of our judiciary is at risk. Thank you. Many thanks, Stephanie. And then finally, before we turn to questions, uh, Keir is going to outline some of the recommendations from the report. Thank you very much indeed. <clears throat> um, so we've got two um, final slides. So I'll just do the penultimate slide and we'll go through our 10 recommendations uh, that we made uh, as a result of uh, our year long project. So if we can just get that on the screen, please. So number one, we've already dealt with um, in my introduction. I'm not going to repeat it. It's there and it's, we say, straightforward. Number two, organised compulsory and ongoing high quality racial bias and anti-racist training for all judges and key workers in the justice system. Uh, and uh, there's a little footnote um, when you read the report. And in terms of workers in the justice system, that includes advocates and individuals working in discipline or recruitment and court staff. And a bit more detail as you read through the report, we say that this training has to be rooted in a recognition of institutional racism combined with the need for structural change. Because if it is, there is a greater possibility of converting understanding into long lasting action. And the training and the education should be tailored to particular justice system groups, not one size fits all. Number three is um, a recommendation that the whole process of judicial appointments needs to be overhauled. Uh, we say in further detail that we should follow the call of the Law Society president, the previous, uh, Stephanie Boyce, who stated that the process of judicial appointment should be restructured and that statutory consultation process should be abolished. Number four, create a critical mass of diverse judges reflective of society rather than the occasional and isolated appointments. This is a recommendation that's been around for some time, as you heard from Stephanie. It will help to combat tokenism, isolationism, and provide an audible voice for ethnic minority judges, as recommended in 2017 by Justice. Number five, publish all judicial research. Uh, we say that all reports and research into the judiciary should be made public 
At present, the Judicial Executive Board has declined to publish a report it commissioned into judicial bullying and racism. The justice system is a public service funded by the taxpayer and the public are entitled to know how well it's functioning and be able to hold it to account. Go to the last page, please. Number six, and following Ethna's um, uh, talk to you, uh, we ask that the Equal Treatment Bench Book is revised. Uh, there's a lot of good work there, but it needs revision. It needs to foreground the importance of combating institutional racism, in particular, the neglected area of racism against black people in the courts. And it also needs to start from a recognition that judges, like everyone else, have socially and psychologically ingrained biases that they need to understand and challenge. And in addition, uh, we recommend that there is an increase in the number of the editors of the bench book who are from black communities who are experts on racism and who are not themselves judges. Uh, we, and it's a section in the report where we look at the history of training going back to the last century. Uh, and we say cues can be taken from the good practice of the bench book authors, their precursors on the Ethnic Minorities Advisory Commission known as EMAC. Number seven, revamp the process for making complaints and to ensure all hearings are recorded and easily accessible. Clear and effective structures for making and dealing with complaints of racism are required so legal professionals and all court users can cite the evidence and make a complaint. That way, decisive action can be taken without fear of career repercussions. Disciplinary procedures should be overseen by a nominated individual trained in conscious and unconscious racist behavior. All complaints should be logged and monitored on a regular basis. Number eight, encourage a culture shift towards anti-racist practice by judges. Racial literacy and a commitment to anti-racism should be considered key competencies for entering and progressing in the judiciary. The expertise of legal professionals, including judges who are already delivering anti-racist justice should be recognized and supported by leadership judges to help accelerate change. Number nine, adopt a multi-pronged approach that sees each of the above recommendations as interrelated and inadequate in isolation or without the support of the other interventions. And number 10, institute a robust accountability and implementation strategy to ensure that progress is substantive rather than merely procedural or performative. An independent and diverse committee of lawyers, legal organizations, academics, legal reform organizations, campaign groups, and experts should, should scrutinize the implementation of the, mem of the measures above. Those are our, uh, our recommendations. We ask you, please, to read the full report. It's going to be available online. And I just want to end with a few words that Leslie Thomas KC deals with in his foreword to this report. Towards the end, he says, when we stop and look at the hard data presented in this work, society can no longer pretend, judges can no longer hide, and those that seek to preserve the status quo 
cannot plead ignorance. Change is coming, and that is for the good of all. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Keir. Um, I can see we're getting a lot of, you're getting a lot of uh, approving uh, emojis, are they? Um, if if everyone on, who was on the panel could come back onto the screen, that would be probably easiest. As we field, we've got just uh, about 18 minutes to field some questions. Um, I suppose I'm gonna start, we've had lots of questions coming in. I'm gonna start with uh, a, a more strategic one, I suppose. And then there are lots, particularly about the Judicial Appointments Committee, which we might turn to. Um, the one is a question about, someone's asked strategically whether the term institutional racism is uh, off-putting or stops the debate because people don't want to acknowledge it, and whether it's more productive to use other tests, for example, the Equality Act for discrimination. So to, rather than talk about institutional racism, to just demonstrate that black people are treated less favorably and so therefore discriminated under the Equality Act. Um, I don't know who would like to respond to that. Um, maybe Keir, would you like to come back on that? Um, I, I would prefer, as we have done in this report, to use the term institutional racism, to, to say it like it is. Um, I, I totally understand that it, it can end up closing down conversations. People don't like that phrase. I, I can see it happening at the moment with the um, debate within the police and the issues that have come up. And uh, some of the wording that's used is very, very careful indeed. So there's talk about bias, but not racist bias or racial bias. Um, I think the time has come, we're, we're in 2022. And, and in this profession, the profession I'm in, we're encouraged to, to uh, speak the truth. Um, and uh, I think it's time to do that. I, I'm getting too old. Uh, to try and find different words um, to make other people comfortable. I um, think it's appropriate um, to say it as it is, um, but to listen to the other side, uh, to start the conversation. And I think then together, um, we'll really make progress. Um, I I'm tired of continually hearing uh, people in a sense say the same thing. Um, and, and us getting nowhere. So um, let's stick with institutional racism. I just wondered if Andrea wanted to say anything about the American context, whether that, um, how it plays there, or how the language is the same or different. Um, so I think, you know, maybe not surprisingly, it's quite similar um, context and experience as well. Um, you know, I think, of course, it's right. Is it institutionalized or systematic, right? Either word you choose um, raises hackles and ire. Um, I think what's interesting also, and you all probably have the same experience, is that um, then you have to explain, because I think, you know, many people just don't understand what you mean by that, um, whether that's actual ignorance or um, uh, feigned ignorance, I don't know. Um, depends on the individual, I guess. But I think, you know, it, it obviously also then behooves us to further explain um, to the extent necessary what what we meant, what we mean by institutionalized or systematic racism. I also, and last thing I'll say is I just also do like to include individual, but I, I like to be very precise, individual um, as well as uh, institutional um, so that people can't either way feel off the hook Right. Um, the same I say bias, I like to use express or unconscious so people can't feel, you know, that they are somehow off off the hook. Um, but yes, similar experience, similar concerns and similar need for education and conversation. Great. Thank you. And as someone pointed out, Remy, you um, gave us a good definition, clear definition of institutional racism. So I'm taking it you're with here. Yeah, I'll, I'll post that definition in the chat now. It comes from 
ACE of Ananda at the Institute of Race Relations. And in that, it also talks about individual racism and how there's a relationship between institutional and individual. I think that's partly why we went with that specific definition. So then if we turn to the question of the Judicial Appointments Committee as one uh, area that there's been quite a lot of questions around, I suppose, first, I wondered whether Leslie could return to that question of the link between the diversity in the judiciary and the outcomes for minoritised people. Um, would you like to say a little bit more about that, Leslie, and then we can turn to maybe what can be done to, with the JAC? Yes, I, I, I think that the point's just a, a straightforward one. Well, it certainly is a straightforward one um, if, if you're a person of colour. Uh, we just need to look at the statistics which are set out in this report. It, it, it is, to my mind, unbelievable that we've reached the 21st century. We still have no black um, um, Court of Appeal or Supreme Court justices. And, you know, where if, if we think about the communities which the judges are meant to serve, they're, they're just not reflecting, that they're, they're not a reflection of society. And it just seems to me that this is beyond argument that our judges should be a proper reflection of society. I don't think this is up for argument anymore. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, and so, uh... I don't know if Stephanie or Keir, would you like to come in on what, what should be done about uh, changing this picture? How do we need a, a complete overhaul of the JAC? Do we need to have different tests for uh, uh, judges, for the appointment of judges? You, you see, I, 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 I'm, not a, I'm not an expert on this. I think Stephanie probably is. Um, all, all I know, um, after spending a year looking at this, is uh, that it needs an overhaul. Um, we still, um, even after a review, have statutory consultation. Uh, other people call it secret soundings, um, chats in the background, um, in terms of the appointment of judges. Um, we have the Law Society president saying the whole thing needs to be overhaul because when you look from an intersection point of view uh, the number of solicitors who become judges um, uh, in some instances you can count on a single hand and particularly if you're an ethnic minority female solicitor and we deal with that in the report and we hear uh, that in some of the survey uh, comments so all I know is that the whole system needs to be overhauled. And if we go right back to the beginning, when we have a strategy that just doesn't deal with the basics, it indicates that something's very wrong. And that's why we want to have this dialogue, this discussion uh, to help change things for the better. Maybe Stephanie probably knows an awful lot more about it, but that's, that's what I've seen in this year that I've been involved in this report. Yeah, I, I don't know an awful, about an awful lot more, but um, yeah, I can I can definitely um, add a few things um, to that. I think, um, I just want to say up front, I think there has been, not tonight, but in the past, some suggestions um, from some areas that going back to the sort of tap on the shoulder way of appointments might even be preferable to what we have now. And I, and I really don't think that is the case. Having an independent appointments uh, commission is vital. But I think, um, as others have stressed, there needs to be a serious look at what criteria we are appointing people by. Um, as I mentioned in, in my brief presentation, I think the way in which merit is assessed, whether that's consciously or unconsciously at the moment, is clearly discriminating against BAME applicants. There is clearly an issue about its previous judicial experience not being properly taken into account um, from the sort of lower ranks of the 
judiciary and the tribunals, which are significantly more diverse than the senior ranks of the judiciary. Um, so I think a proper look at the uh, appointments process and 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 why it's get, it's coming up with the outcomes that it is, and a serious consideration of how merit is defined is, is required. I should flag that um, there has been a lot of outreach activities to encourage and increase applications from diverse candidates. And the statistics show that these have been successful. We, there's a huge overrepresent, not huge, but there's quite a large overrepresentation of black and minority ethnic candidates applying for judicial roles, but they're not being appointed. Um, solicitors as well um, are not being appointed. And uh, as Keir mentioned, the intersection between uh, race and professional background and when you add gender into the mix as well um, is, is a serious issue. Thank you, Stephanie. I th as we're drawing towards the end, I wanted to um, ask a question really about what next. So people have asked, um, what is the what are the next steps in implementing uh, some of your recommendations, and particularly uh, how much it's dependent on the actions of the Lord Chief Justice. Um, and so perhaps uh, Keir or I think could tell us a little bit about what work's being done to uh, promote the recommendations. Or will be done. Yes, it's 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 just starting the the, the conversation. Um, we've obviously focused very much on completing the report, um, checking it and double checking it, um, and circulating it. Um, but the next step is to have a conversation. Um, I'd love to have a conversation with this team and um, Lord Chief Justice um, to see where things can be changed, uh, whether there can be um, an acknowledgement, our first recommendation of institutional racism in the justice system. As we said right at the beginning, uh, many institutions have started that process of looking at themselves, recognizing that there is a problem, accepting that there is a problem, and then very importantly, doing something about it. And, it, and if we can start that, um, with those uh, who are in positions of power, then there would be a hope that these recommendations can be implemented. But we mean it when we say at number nine that they all have to be implemented. Because if all you do is acknowledge institutional racism in your institution and then carry on with a bit of training, nothing will change. In fact, it'll probably get worse. So it's a big job, it's a massive job, and this is just the start, but I, I, I'm convinced we're going in the right direction. Great, thank you. I, um, I suppose the, that's the final question then, is, is how, how much this, this role of the judiciary fit, fits into other uh, inequalities and uh, institutional racism within the criminal justice system. And I suppose uh, it's just a part of that story. I don't know if anyone wants to, to respond to that thought about the, the relationship between that and other aspects of the criminal justice system. Uh, Remy, I don't know, or Leslie? Yeah, Leslie's coming in. Can I come in on that? Um... Whilst it is just another um, piece of the jigsaw in the criminal justice system, I think what we need to acknowledge is that it's very, it's a very important part because when we look at some of the statistics, if we just look at the 2017 Lamy um, review and it looks at the disproportionality of how um, black people uh, in particular, are impacted in the criminal justice system. Um, you know, 12% more black prisoners in adult prisons, 21% more black children in um, youth detention centers, um, black people are more likely to receive harsher sentences, less likely to receive bail. You know, this isn't an opinion. 
This is just looking at the statistics. This is counting. When we stop and look at all of these figures, all of them were put, you know, all of these people who were refused bail, ended up with harsher sentences, ended up in prison, were all put there by judges. Great, thank you very much. Well, I think, uh, did Keir, Keir, were you wanting to say something? Um, well, I, I've just been uh, sent a message um, by a judge. And this judge would like me to read the message out. She, she uh, was unable to stay for the full duration. And I, I'd just like to do that, take maybe a minute or so. And I think it underlines um, how complex um, the problem is, how difficult it is, but how brave this particular judge is in terms of speaking out. Um, she says this, please mention this. How do we change without a change of structure? Over 5,000 judges. In capitals, no behavioural code, no anti-bullying code. Any mention of racism in the judiciary is shut down. If we raise it, we are shut down. With appointments, with advancement, how can we get it right to those over whom we preside? How is a culture of fear the basis for judicial independence or equality? The judiciary should be leading. The master of the roles acknowledged bullying last Thursday in his keynote speech to the Legal Services Board. But what is actually being done to deal with it? No code. Question mark. As chair of the JSN, that's the Judicial Support Network, I have had over 200 separate complaints of unfair treatment. There are many good judges of all backgrounds and races who care deeply. We could do much more if the culture changes. It's not just numbers. At present, only those who tow the line are welcome. That needs to change. And I see no sign of that. That's Callie Call, KC, Chair of the Judicial Support Network. Well, I think that's a very powerful place to end it and uh, a call for significant reform and culture change, which this report is, as you say, Keir, part of the conversation. So I want to thank all our panellists for their very uh, important contributions and to everyone for attending. The large numbers of you here shows that show that there is significant um, interest and commitment in this area. So thank you very much. <laughs>